Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, Stephen Lightfoot. But before I introduce him, integrated care boards. I thought a few words about that. They will come into being in a few days' time, um, and they're a result of the 1920, uh, no, 1920, 2021 health and uh, care bill. But you know, some of us have been around the NHS for so long, we think we may have seen these things before in a different guise. So. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Stephen might even refer to that. There'll be 42 of these little buggers across the country, uh, empowering health and care organisations to work with partners to deliver better joined up health care services to the populations they serve, and we hope uh, reduce health inequalities. So uh, Stephen himself, He's, uh, he's, he's uh, a man who's been around, he's been in Sussex for nearly, nearly 30 years, uh, so he's a Sussex boy, born and bred, um, and uh, he's chair designate of Sussex Health Care Partnership Integrated Care Board, only for another few days, uh, so the designate will be shed like a sort of a skin, and you can be the real person. Uh, you're also chair of Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority, uh, the acronym is MHRA, and for eight years was deputy chair of Sussex Community NHS Trust uh, Foundation Trusts and a non-executive chair of Sussex Primary Care. And uh, prior, prior to that, he's had a 30-year career, uh, career in life sciences. So he, I think he's well equipped to take on all the challenges that uh, Louise set out, that uh, Health Watch uh, goes on about, and tell us how it's all going to be better. So over to you. Right. Well, thank you, Geoffrey. So good morning, everybody. Uh, Louise, fantastic speech, actually, and uh, I, I take up the challenge. So I, I think my role is as chair. I'm going to use, lose the designate from today, actually, is what I've decided. So I'll be the chair of the NHS Sussex Integrated Care Board. And I applied for this job quite specifically because I think there's a better way. If we all look at the, uh, the media, we see all the problems put in front of us every day. The NHS hasn't, hasn't got enough money. The NHS hasn't got enough staff. You know, people have to wait. I don't see it as banging on Louise. I think people are waiting too long. It's as simple as that. They can't get access to a GP or a dentist or anything else. And if you read the media, you'd think it's a complete disaster. Well, I've got a slightly more optimistic perspective than that. I think there are some real significant issues, but I think there's a better way forward. And what I think I'd like to talk about today is how we can genuinely start to move forward with better health and care for all. But it won't happen overnight. So let's be really clear about that. And let's talk about how we might want to do that. Now, Jeffrey's already spoke, stolen my first slide. So I think he was at a sneak preview, actually. Uh, it is about the Health and Care Act. Um, and, and actually, that has set up these integrated care systems. But why is that being done? The bill is really clearly designed to actually identify that we want to actually improve long-term population health outcomes. We also absolutely need to reduce the inevitable and, well, they aren't inevitable, but the actual uh, health inequalities in both access, inexperience and outcomes that exist, not just across the country, but in this county too. And we need to address that. The NHS gets about 40% of the entire tax revenue of this country. But we need, keep saying we need more money. There isn't going to be any more money. We do need to make better use of the money that we've got. And I think that comes into play as well. And also, we're a major employer. We employ over 35,000 staff in Sussex. So we've got a real responsibility in terms of supporting social and economic growth within our communities from a sustainable point of view. And I think in many ways, what it's doing is formalizing the local leadership of the NHS and actually really embedding partnership working as the way to address things. So that's really what it's all about. So that's what we're trying to achieve. But Jeffrey's quite right. Many of you in the room will have seen this many more times than I have in terms of the NHS, here we go again. So the question is, why is it gonna be different this time? Well, I think actually one of the differences, is this is building on the way the NHS and social care has already started to work. I don't pretend it's perfect, but there's already a level of collaboration and cooperation already existing. So I think that's not a radical change. I see this more as an evolution, an extension, and a strengthening of things that have already started. 
I think one of the key differences is going to be we're going to put the population first. It would be no accident on the 6th of July, which will be the first meeting of the NHS Sussex Integrated Care Board, the first paper on the first board meeting will be about the population of Sussex. That is not an accident. A, another paper on that uh, board meeting will also be about primary care. That's not an accident. So we're going to you know, start thinking, what are the things that matter to people and will actually genuinely make the most difference to the most people? The spirit of this act and, and actually the way we're setting ourselves up is around collaboration, not competition. I'm not going to make any political points around you know, the way that the health system has been set up from the Lansley reforms of 2012. But actually the NHS fighting against each other, every organisation, dog eat dog, trying to win this contract, win that contract. How is that good for patient care? I don't think it is. I don't think it was. And it's not going to be the future that we look forward to. So collaboration, not competition. But I think the thing is, we face a million things we need to do. And the truth is, we come with all the great intentions of trying to do everything. And I just don't honestly believe that is possible. So we're going to have to have the courage to say we're going to be selective and we're going to phase the things we need to do so that we can have the most impact to the most people in the shortest time. And then we'll do the next thing and then we'll do the next thing. So this has to be quite deliberate rather than pretending we've got a million priorities, which in other words is we've got no priorities. And I think it involves public dialogue. So again, you know, what David doesn't know today is I was invited with Adam Doyle to go to an NHS England event today with all the leaders of NHS England. I have asked Adam to go to that meeting because I wanted to come to this meeting because I believe my role is here within Sussex. We've got to do something that's right. We can't just keep talking internally to ourselves. We've got to talk to the public that matter. On Friday, I'm going to the first public engagement event in Littlehampton. And, and we, we're going to carry on this journey because we've got to have a really grown up, mature conversation with the public. I don't think the public's expectation of what we can deliver is realistic. That's not nice to hear. It's not easy to say, but it does happen to be the truth. So I think what we are going to have to do with the public is say, this is what we can do and when we can do it. And then we'll do something else the next year and something else the next year. That will be deeply unpopular. It'll be, you know, really quite emotional, but it will at least be honest. And I think that's the approach that we need to play. And, and, and I, that's why I think Health Watch is so important, because we're going to need Health Watch to help us with this. Not to defend us, but to help us to interpret the public criticism, to make sure we make the right choices at the right time to have the most impact on our public. That's why I think this is different. I don't think that's the way the NHS has traditionally approached it. We have to have a grown-up, mature conversation. That's the way I'd like to uh, lead, the, lead this structure. Because I think, actually, our communities need our health and care services now more than ever before. The cost of living crisis is a really big deal, and we've got to play our part in that and make sure people are protected and supported. So that, that's my view of why I think it's different. Jeffrey will probably give me a hard time about that later, so we'll come to that then. So let's just change back to why we're here. We're here to serve our population of Sussex. Now you'll all know the 1,461 square miles of Sussex, you know, from uh, right over here, West Wittering and Chichester over in the west to Rye and Camber Sands over in the east, from Brighton down here up to Gatwick Airport. That's the area we cover. 1.7 million people live in our county. 76% of those live in two cities and 21 towns of over 10,000 people. Big areas of countryside, pretty poor public transport links in the majority of that. And there's also about 55 million visitors come into Sussex each year. And of course, many of them, when they've had a few drinks, need to go and visit our lovely A&E departments. But the reality is we need to provide health and care services to all 1.7 million people, not just a subset, all 1.7 million people, wherever they live. And we're going to have to organize ourselves to be able to deliver on that. What about our population? Well, our population is growing, but it's also aging. And of course, as we know, uh, the older you get, frankly, the more health and care support that you need. So yes, we've got nearly a million people in the 18 to 64 age group. We've got about 334,000 people in that 0 to 17. 
uh, and then we've got 386,000 in the 65 plus. All these numbers are changing today because the ONS is going to publish its uh, 21 census results. So this, this pie chart will have to be updated. But what's quite important, if you look at the growth rates, 0 to 7, 17 plus 2%, 18 to 64 plus 2%, and then the 65 plus plus 7%. That's the growing time bond we've got in terms of being able to provide the services that we need to support the population that we serve. And that's higher than the national average. So we've got an older population than the rest of the country. Again, some of the biggest clinical needs, you know, we all are well aware of heart disease, you know, but we've got 253,000 patients in Sussex on blood pressure medication. We've got 141,000 with atrial fibrillation, a condition of the heart. We've got 105 asthma patients. We've got 31,000 COPD patients. You know, we've got uh, yeah, 30, nearly 40,000 people recovering from a stroke. We've got 70,000 patients with cancer. We've got 87,000 patients with diabetes. Now that's just the clinical health needs. And as Louise mentioned, the social determinants of health, it's much more than just the NHS perspective on this, because the NHS perspective around uh, being able to support health and care is probably about 20%, you know, one in five of the, of the overall proportion. It's about housing, it's about income, it's about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the lifestyle that people live all have a massive, massive impact on people's health. So actually we can fix it. This is the NHS sickness service. That's our job. How can we get into the preventative agenda to actually stop people getting sick in the first place? Now, that will be much, much more interesting from my perspective. And again, this costs money. You know, as you can see here on the bottom, 33 million GP prescriptions last year, 33 million on 1.7 million people. So I, I haven't had any prescriptions in the last year, so someone's got my share. But the reality is that's a lot of prescriptions that have cost nearly half a billion pounds worth of medicines. So that's a real cost to the NHS. And I think if we address inequalities, that cost is going to go up because I think actually medication used proportionately and correctly can actually help to address some of our issues. Something that makes me really cross is looking at the health inequalities. And if you look at the healthy life expectancy, so I'm lucky, I live in the Mid-Sussex area. So that would give me an average life expectancy of 69 years. Why should someone living in Hastings, same age as me, have a lower life expectancy by nearly seven years? That is not acceptable in anyone's book and shouldn't be. Now, that's not going to be easy to fix. It's not going to be fixed tomorrow. This is a long-term project, but we have to address some of these basic fundamental inequalities. And I think that's why this change is different. And if we look at core 20 plus five, which is obviously a major national initiative in terms of the five key areas that we need to address where there's the most inequality, maternity services, severe mental illness, chronic respiratory disease, early cancer diagnosis and hypertension, again, back to some of the clinical components, but others as well. That's probably where we're going to have to address and focus our efforts in the first instance. What we've got to make sure we do, though, is that everyone has got equal access easy to say, more difficult to do, equal experience, and also then equal outcomes. This is a long-term journey, and we shouldn't shy away from the fact that this is not going to be fixed on the 1st of July, on Friday, just because we've got a new integrated care board put in place. But that's the challenge. And also, we need to own the feedback that we've received. It's not just the media that's saying this is not good enough. And yes, it was lovely that I think people are very grateful for the support they've received from the NHS during COVID. I think people genuinely are grateful for that. But people are still not getting the care they need when they need it. That's what we've been told. We have to own that. Different people want to access our services in different ways and at different times. That's not easy to deliver logistically. Not everybody wants to work a night shift. Not everybody wants to work in the NHS at weekends. But our population are asking for that. Digital health is part of the solution. It's absolutely not the only solution. And again, we have to think about how we manage that. 
The services and organizations that we've got don't always work in a joined up way. That's just the reality. And I'll come on to how we maybe start to address that. And actually people are saying it's really difficult to communicate with the NHS. It's big, it's complex, and we frankly don't know, know where to go. We have to own that. It's not, it's not, it's not the people of, of Sussex's fault that they can't find, you know, don't know where to go and they end up at the A&E department because it's the only place that's open 24 hours a day. We need to help people navigate our really complex landscape and that's something we're going to need to do. So we have to own this feedback as difficult it is to hear because that's the reality and people's perception is their reality. And then we need to make the changes that are required. And that's again, the challenge that I've got uh, alongside all of my other colleagues within the NHS. So we keep talking about the NHS. The NHS is not one organization. I know people like to think it is. In Sussex alone, and I mean in West Sussex, East Sussex and Brighton and Hove, there are over 1,100 different NHS organizations and locations. That's in Sussex. So that's why it's not joined up. It's because it's really, really fragmented. You know, if you look at it, we've got 160 GP practices, 315 community pharmacies, 344 dentists, 141 uh, ophthalmic services, 95 different communities and locations. That's before we talk about the 14 community hospitals, seven minor injuries units, six urgent treatment centers, seven major hospitals and 14 specialist hospitals. This is why it's complicated. So again, we've got a job here to sort of really understand. But we do have resources, despite what the media say, we've got three and a half billion pounds, well, I exaggerate, it's 3.44 actually, to spend in this financial year. That's the allocation from NHS England to NHS Sussex. That's a lot of money. Are we using every single pound of that wisely? I honestly don't believe we are. So when people say we haven't got enough money, we need to make the best use of the money we've got first. And I think that's the starting point. And as I said, we employ more than 35,000 staff. Now, maybe we need 40,000, but let's at least make sure the staff that we've got are well supported, well trained, well looked after, respected, valued and developed. So I think there's a really big piece of work around the, uh, you know, the development uh, of, of our workforce. Our NHS cannot do this alone. And I think, again, this is another reason why I think it's different. We have to acknowledge the fact the NHS can only do so much on its own. And I think we've got incredible people working in primary care, incredible people working in urgent care, incredible people working in planned care or community care or mental health care. Everyone in their own silo is doing the very, very best that they can. What you hear from the population of Sussex is, it's not joined up. So getting from one part to the other is just clunky. And we also need to think about how we also involve public health, because actually the prevention agenda is going to be really important. The discharge to social care, and I honestly believe the 6,000 know, voluntary community and social enterprise organizations in Sussex are also part of the family and part of the solution. So the NHS has got to be less arrogant, and has got to be more open to working together, in my opinion. And so integration of services, I honestly believe, will provide a better patient experience. And it, integration is joining it all up. I think it'll also be more efficient. So we don't have people you know, ringing up 111, going to, being told, oh, well, you go to the urgent treatment centre in, in Brighton at three o'clock. They go to Brighton, wait for four hours. Then they're told you need to go and see your GP. That's a real life example I've heard when I was doing a service visit down at the Royal County uh, a, a few months ago. That's not efficient use of time. It's a terrible patient experience and it's just delaying people getting the help that they need. We need to join this system up and that's the challenge. Now I haven't got a magic wand and I haven't got all the answers yet, but I really understand what the issue we've got to address is. So how are we gonna to start to approach this? Well, it comes by adopting uh, the new legislative framework. So we've got to have something called an integrated care partnership. We've got to have something called an integrated care board. It's all in an integrated care system. And quite frankly, no one's got a bloody clue what any of that all means. You know, so actually what I think we're going to have is we're going to have a Sussex Health and Care Assembly. 
All the NHS England people will call it an ICP. We're going to call it a Sussex Health and Care Assembly. And that really is the, uh, going to be an inclusive organisation I'll come on to that will set the strategic direction for our system in Sussex. We'll have something called NHS Sussex that will be formed at midnight on Friday. And that role will be to actually fundamentally take that strategy and allocate the resources, set the priorities within the NHS and actually make sure that we start to make the improvements that are needed. And then we're going to work at the three places, what we're going to call places, Brighton and Hove, East Sussex and West Sussex, completely coterminous with the local authority boundaries, because actually we need to work collaboratively with the local authorities. And that, I think, is going to be the engine room for the growth and the service development. It's not going to be done by me in an office, in a boardroom. That's just not going to achieve it. It needs to be done locally with local communities, with local people and local partners. Because even where the health needs are the same, the partners delivering those services in Brighton and Hove, East Sussex, West Sussex will be different. That's why we need to do, address that. And so our partners, as you can see, there will include ourselves, the council, the universities, the VCSE Alliance, and also Health Watch too, as an important part of that. And I'll, I'll come on to that in a sec. But what we need to do as a system is to agree a consistent set of priorities, because at the moment, yeah, the NHS is doing its wonderful thing and different parts of the NHS are doing their own priorities. Every trust has got its own strategy and that's great, but it's not joined up. Local authorities are doing three completely different things as well, or similar, sometimes different. Uh, and, and then you've got all the other sort of alliances all trying to do the best they can to find how do we link into this. If we can have a grown-up conversation, say, these are the five things we're going to do this year, these are the five things we're going to do next year, these are the five things we're going to do the year after, suddenly I think we can start to make a difference that the patients and the public will see. If we carry on trying to do 100 things at the same time, it won't happen, I guarantee it. So what does that look like? Can we move the slide on? Yeah, or back one, please. We, 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 yeah, there we go. So the assembly will, will technically be a statutory joint committee between NHS Sussex and the three local authorities. And it's going to have a broad membership. So three NHS Sussex members, three health and wellbeing chairs from our lo three local authorities. We're going to have three place executive leaders, three clinicians, three voluntary sector organisations, three health watch members, three university members, three specialist members representing things like housing, local enterprise and further education. It's a conscious decision of mine that I wanted to involve each of the three health watches in this particular assembly. We need to hear the patient voice in the same way I need to hear the clinical voice. I need to see the academic voice. I need to hear the NHS voice. I need to hear the local authority voice. This is what an assembly is bringing it all together. And so what, and our key responsibility is to develop an integrated care strategy for Sussex. And that will be built up from the health and wellbeing strategies that exist, all to different timescales across the three local authorities in Sussex. So we can have a single plan to 2030. And we've got to do that by Christmas. So that's the first action that we've got to deliver. NHS Sussex. Um, yeah, it will be the statutory organisation that will be responsible for the whole of the NHS here in Sussex. And that will include myself as the chair, uh, as far as the board's concerned, five executive members. So there's Adam Doyle, who many of you will know as the chief executive. There's Alison Cannon as our chief uh, nursing officer. We've got Dinesh Sinar, a psychiatrist, as our chief medical officer. We've got Hannah Hamilton from NHS England as our chief financial officer. And we've got a chief primary care officer. I didn't have to have a chief primary care officer on my board. I wanted to have a chief primary care officer on my board because we need to fix primary care. That was a deliberate strategic decision. And that's Amy Galia, who's also, you know, some of you will be aware of. Got five independent non-executive directors and Louise is one of those. Again, not an accident that we've got a senior member of Health Watch on my board. I wasn't quite sure how that was gonna work out, but that's what I always wanted. I wanted patient voice again there. I've got Sue Marshall, who's an ex-chief nurse from Sussex Community Trust as a clinician, as a non-executive director, because I think we need to hear the clinical voice too. I've got. I've got uh, a guy called Bola Laffey. He runs a business in Crawley. 
uh, you know, and, and, and actually, yeah, so he's got a vested interest and he, he's got a really interesting background in investment banking. So he's going to be key, key on the finance. We've got Ash Sonny. He's a pharmacist from East Grinstead. And, and, and again, he's going to bring that pharmacy perspective, another perspective of primary care onto my board, not an accident. And we've got Paul King, an ex-auditor an, an ex from Ernst & Young as our audit committee chair. And I've got Festina Bayo uh, as an associate non-executive director from Brighton, uh, who again will actually sort of bring an, another different dimension of community and, and, and rural uh, you know, parish council engagement in particular. I wanted to have my six non-executive directors, like myself, to be Sussex residents, to have a vested interest in the population that we serve. That was really important to me. And we'll have five partner members. So we've got a GP, Raghu Rajan from Newark. Uh, we're going to have a partner, uh, a provider member. We've got a director of public health, Alison Challenger from, uh, from West Sussex. We've got a director of children's services. Uh, we'll be Deb Austin from Brighton. And we'll have a director of adult social services, Mark Staten from East Sussex. So again, we're bringing in the local authorities with the range of experiences that we've got. And I think that will give us a strong board. And, and actually, I don't really want to admit this, but as of the 1st of July, NHS Sussex will be responsible for pharmacy, optometry and dentistry. So I'm really not sure I want that, but I think we have to fix that too. So let's be clear, we're taking over all the CCG responsibilities. They will close at midnight on Thursday um, and we'll be, be picking up those pharmacy, optometry and dentistry responsibilities from NHS England from Friday. So again, please give us at least a weekend to try and work out what we do about dental contracts. But again, that's a serious conversation. We are, there's a real issue in terms of access to dentists. We know that. But I think the real work is going to get done in these three place but health and care partnerships, you know, Brighton and Hove, East Sussex and West Sussex. And, and, and the purpose is to involve and coordinate it, all the local partners. So not just the NHS, not just the local authorities, but absolutely including the voluntary and community segment too. All our partners have agreed the primacy of place. All of our NHS providers have agreed that rather than just having thinking about their own footprint, they will actually have senior leaders that will be on these place partnership boards. Now that's a really big deal for Sussex Partnership Trust that acts across all three places. Sussex Community Trust acts across all three places. University Hospital Sussex across two places. It's quite easy for ESHT because they obviously are just uh, in, in the one place. But that becomes quite important that we've got to start thinking about local services for local people. So we're already starting to get our NHS providers to ch change the way they work to serve the population of Sussex better. And, and, and these places will be jointly led by a director of adult social services and a place-based leader that we're going to appoint. So again, I think that's again, another reason why I think this is going to be different. But I think each place will be the engine room for, for change. How does it all add together? Well, if I was designing this myself, I probably wouldn't have had all these different components. However, our politicians and masters ultimately have determined that we have to have some of these structures. So we will have an assembly that will set the strategy. NHS Sussex will take that strategy, delegate the function and the resources to each of the three places. We will then report back to the health and wellbeing boards, which will then reinform the strategy. That's the best way I can find to link the things I've got to have on a statutory basis into something that will practically work. Because at the end of the day, this has to work. If it doesn't work, we're just kidding ourselves. So I'm really keen to make sure that we achieve that. Importantly, what does this really mean for local people? Well, we've got to work in a more joined up way, which is really, really easy to say. It's really, really, really difficult to do. But we do need to start addressing waiting times. And that's waiting times to get to a GP, waiting times to get to a dentist, waiting times to get emergency care, waiting times to get your, you know, the planned care that you need. I think we really also got to make sure we don't forget the children and the young people of this county. I think the mental health of our young people has been probably more dis disproportionately affected during COVID than any other part of our community. If we're not going to do something around that as a key priority in year one, I will be hugely disappointed. 
I can't prejudge it because it's not my decision, but I can guarantee I'll be banging on to do, lose, uh, use Louise's point to say we need to make sure we do something for young people. We've got to find a way of better supporting people with long-term needs and multiple conditions. Most of our aging population, they don't have one thing wrong. They've got multiple issues that need to be addressed and they need, therefore need multiple parts of the system to address their needs. If we're really gonna put the patient first, we need to think about how we wrap around that appropriate care around that. And then we also need to help people stay well and independent for as long as we possibly can. But this is gonna be the, where the really difficult discussions are going to take place because we could make an argument for every single person to have an, almost, we ask 1.7 million people what they want, we'll get 2 million answers. And we, can, we can't operate in that way. So we're gonna have to make some tough choices based on where do we think we can make the biggest health gains for the most people in the shortest possible time. This is where we need, again, to work with HealthWatch because we need you to help us to navigate through some of those choices. We're not expecting you to make the decision. Yeah? As, a, as a board, we'll make the decision. It's our responsibility. We have to own that, but we need to make an informed decision and that's why we need you. And we want to make the best use of the resources that we've got. Our resources are finite. I refuse to use the word limited because I think three and a half billion pounds, 35,000 staff is a lot of resource. But we can think about better ways of using it. So that's where we're heading. I haven't got the answers today, but I think in terms of the next steps, this is going to happen in the sense that the cl clinical commissioning groups will close down at 12 o'clock at midnight on Thursday. The new NHS Sussex organization will be established and will be responsible from Friday at midnight. We won't have a board meeting on Friday at midnight, you'll be pleased to know Louise, but we will be responsible from that moment. The Sussex Health and Care Assembly will have its first meeting during July to start thinking about how we're going to set the priorities and set the strategy that has to be done by Christmas. You know, we'll then take the NHS Sussex delivery plan and that's a very deliberate word, delivery plan, not a business plan, not a nice little document with lots of pictures in it. What are we going to deliver in the first full year? And we have to have that agreed by 31st of March. And actually to deliver that, we'll need our place-based partnerships to be operational, fully recruited, everyone clear what they're doing by the 1st of April. So as you can see, we're starting to work through quite systematically how are we going to approach it? So I can't give you the answer today of exactly how we're going to suddenly make it all better, but we are going to be really strategic, really deliberate, and really determined to make a difference here. And as I said, I think Health Watch again has a vital role in helping us to navigate that. We don't need you to do our job for us. We don't need more criticism. We need constructive advice. Help us to work through the solutions. What's going to give us the biggest impact to the most people? That's where we need you. And that is my ask and challenge to you. Thank you very much.